thank you to the Aga Khan Museum for giving us the opportunity today to share some of our art with you. My name is Hussein. I'm here with Celine George, a great artist and storyteller. Together, we're going to share a little bit of poetry with you. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're keeping safe and healthy. I know everybody should be physical distancing right now. Uh, so we thought we'd try and give you something else to think about. I love me some poutine. And I say Z na Z, see, I am Canadian. But my nationality doesn't define me. I'm a true believer in the beaver, and I hail from the true, no strong, and free, and Jimmy, Drizzy, Drake, Champagne, Poppy, whatever you want to call them. I remember Jimmy from Degrassi, although I was never a fan. I still am Canadian. But my nationality doesn't define me. And it's funny how people always ask me where I'm from, as if knowing my country of origin will shed some light on who I really am, so I tell them I am Canadian. And they look at me, nah, Hussein, where you really from? I was born and raised in Scarborough, lived in Pickering, grew up singing T. O. But still, that don't make me Canadian. See them Canadians who stole this land look at me as an immigrant, something insignificant. They call me a minority, as if, I'm just a minor piece of the city. They act like their forefathers never traveled across the seas and searched for the lands of opportunities while not opting for unity. And as if generation after generation never came here to displace and erase the First Nations claiming this country as their own and then calling it home. But you know, I'm the immigrant. They didn't have to show no papers, so they're the innocent. So I tell them, I'm East African descended from Indian because my forefathers were fathered as Ugandan, whether it was medicine or hustling, all they cared about was the betterment of the community they grew up in. But in the end, Idi Amin kicked them out for being Indian and none of them had even seen the South Asian subcontinent. I mean, if I went to Gujarat or Delhi or Punjab, I'd be lost and dismissed. All these Indians be looking at me like, who's this funny looking tourist? Canadian. East African, Indian, nobody wants a piece of all of this. So I tell them my great, 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 great grandfather was Australopithecus. That's right, before Homo sapiens and Homo habilis was the earliest of the hominid genus. So don't define me by my nationality because people create borders and borders cause hurt. And you asking where I'm from? Shoo. I'm just going to tell you, I'm an earthling. Hi, my name is Celine, and these next few verses is titled sanctuary. Rooted in the word Santa, no, no, not the man dressed in red and white from the North Pole, no, but Santa, meaning sacred, a haven and a place to be safe in. I think of the savanna, this majestic ecosystem, where the ground is somewhat brown and arid and dry, but its creatures so colorful and alive the elephant, giraffe, and the lion all sharing this land in perfect harmony and thriving. The land, it has cracks on the ground that form lines of separation, but crossing over is their right. There are no boundaries in creation. It's the largest terrestrial migration, imagine. The ground is shaking. Thousands of wildebeests, herds of lions, and families of hippos all stomping. The earth is trembling. These animals are all mixed in and running together, traveling for miles and miles in search of water, answering this innate call that we all have for survival, sharing their ground and their earth with all that are around, singing Hakuna Matata. They dance and they shout. Because see, they know this land is not just one of theirs. There's no line on a map that can dare to separate as they travel from the Serengeti in Tanzania to the Maasai Mara in Kenya. There's no need for any travel documents, a passport or a visa. You see mother nature, she knows you don't close your doors on each other. The great migration is a natural wonder of the world. People from all over gather in awe, saying ooh and ah, trying to capture that perfect shot of the wildebeest and the zebra in flawless cohesion. Conservatives and liberals 
standing next to each other and admiring this vision, understanding how nature fundamentally needs this transaction for its own survival and for our next generation. And then we leave this vacation. We return back to our homes and turn on our television to hear the same words, just in a different formation. Migrant. Immigrant. Refugee. People of color is all I see, different shades of brown and black wanting to take from me, not here, my friend, this ain't your sanctuary. Go back to your country. It's a different language that you speak on our values we can't meet. We don't have the resources that you need. Too bad you didn't sneak in a hundred years ago with me and my clique. I'm sorry, son, but you missed your seat. But now I'll repeat. Mother Nature, she knows you don't close your doors for those that seek. When they land at your step, all frail and weak ask and they shall receive migrant or refugee my friends we all deserve a sanctuary tell me why people want to define me by my association to a single nation as if my entire identity everything that makes me me is rooted from a place in which my blood may have been raised in i mean i think we're all more than this really i think we're in a amalgamation of all the people we're connected to and the places we're shaped in. How can you define me by a place anyway? A space defined by a single moment of time. Defined by pencil lines easily erased and redrawn anyway. Easily erased as easily as the families displaced and relocated anywhere. How can you define me by my association to a single nation? A place where foreign invaders from foreign lands drew foreign lines in our familiar sands over and over and over and my partner's grandmother will tell you she's Gwadari. Born on the southern coast of Pakistan in this tiny little port city whose flags have changed time and time again throughout history. See, people have been living in Gwadar for centuries and eventually some great empire will show up to claim their reign over the entire community. First you had the Persian Empire followed by Alexander and his armies. Then came the Mughal Empire, the Omanis, and now everybody in Gwadar be considered Pakistani. But with all this influence from China, shoot, they might as well be Chinese. So how are you going to define her by her association to a single nation, a place where foreign invaders from foreign lands drew foreign lines that are familiar sands over and over and over and They define me as Indian. Defining me by my association to the Indus Valley where a river divided the land and politics and society where traditionally people would define themselves by caste, language, labor, or countless other divisions, but when the Brits showed up, they didn't give a what, they just called them all Indians. Then came 1947, the Brits were gone and India partitioned, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the two new divisions, but if you got beautiful, brown skin, rich with melanin, and they can't pronounce your name exactly, it don't matter your caste, language, labor, they're just gonna call you a Paki. So why do I continue to be defined by pencil lines from places that have never ever felt like mine? Where foreign invaders from foreign lands will continue to change those boundaries over time, but those boundaries can't bound me. My roots have no country crossing continents divided by oceans of colonialism and racism. I'm the son of a hustler and a chemist who sought refuge after being expelled forcefully. My mother's tongue is Gujarati, sprinkled with a little Swahili. I came home surrounded by the smells of chicken fingers, grilled cheese, dal, akni, mogo, and matoki. My heart beats to the drum of a tribe called Quest, Bob Marley, and Ram Lakhan. I am an Ismaili Muslim whose roots run everywhere under the sun. It's not about where my roots are from, but how far my roots have come. Let me start with a question. What is your sanctuary? When do you feel the most at peace? The calm of the mind, the intentional inhale, and the sigh on release, the moment my head hits the pillow. Just for a second, my mind draws a blank, the heavy lifting is done, Celine, for today you've spent your hours. Let's take a moment and breathe. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. 
I feel it every Saturday afternoon as I drive back to my parents and enter their family room. Decades of memories, pictures and frames, furniture and tables left unchanged and my parents in their typical range with arms wide open and I'm in their embrace. Love's everywhere and is all I can see. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. I feel it at church. If you've been to Mass, walk with me on this path. The sermon is spoken, the words have awoken, the bread has been broken. The Lord's Prayer recited in unison, and just before I receive communion, there is a moment of silence. My mind is as clear as can be. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. I feel it when I write, as the words, they travel from my mind down my neck, through my shoulders and into my hands, as the pen that I hold has no choice but to scribe. As it curves and crosses in peaks and valleys, the paper, it holds my words so strongly like the roots of the trees that it came from. My mind is full and my soul is set free. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. I feel it in company and fellowship with one another. Surrounded by my friends and family, ever notice how we always gravitated to a circle? No rough edges or lines of separation. It's the perfect formation as we laugh and enjoy our creation. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. I feel it with complete strangers. In the tiniest of moments we share, it could be the smallest of interactions at the checkout lane or the longest conversation with your neighbor on the plane. I've realized that physical worlds can separate this connection, which is our resting state. Our collective consciousness consumes what I feel. I close my eyes, I'm at peace. I feel it in nature in the mountains or at the beach, listening to the sound of the waves or staring at the rays through the trees. My senses heightened, but my awareness so still. My heart is pacing and nature's embracing colors all around me, blue, yellow, and green. I close my eyes and I'm at peace. Do you see, when I'm at peace, I sigh at the weight of my day and my duty. I see the smiling faces of my friends and my family. I hear the stories of strangers in my community. I can feel the earth and am grounded by humility. I read the words of my mind and my creativity and I pray to my Lord, my creator and my deity. My friends, it doesn't matter the place or the scenery. The peace that I seek, it lies within me. My body is the highest temple and my true sanctuary. Growing up, I was always told about this idea of fun of Allah, or being one with Allah. I'd say to myself, God, you are my Everest. And I will climb that mountain of life without ever resting just to reach you. See, God was the mountain peak. So I had to spend my life trying to get to. God was one and I was two, creating this kind of duality. Not really understanding the true reality. You see, la ilaha illallah means there is no God but God. Take that in though. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. One more time. La ilaha illallah, there is no God but God. There is no being but God, no existence but the existence of God. See, God wasn't just the mountain peak, but my ice pick. God's the shoes I would use to try and get to the top. God's the rope I'd hold on to just in case I drop. God is the entire mountain and not just the highest spot. Shoo. God's everything the universe holds, the whole lot. And this idea of fun of Allah. It's not about two entities becoming one, but really understanding that there are none. None but Allah. See, Ibn Arabi would say, the true goal is this realization that there is no existence but that of God alone. And all them philosophers and mystics and poets have known it's a 
constant exploration to try and understand God and his creation. The great ones, though. The great ones always talk about the true search coming from within, but will looking at the man in the mirror give me a clear picture of what I'm searching for? All this time I've been looking out at the night sky through a telescope. Should I have been looking inside through a microscope? And how can I see God through my eyes and my lens? Don't I need God's glasses just to see him? If there is no existence but God, no duality, then is God me? Will this inner contemplation, trying to understand every revelation, be the way in which I take in this true reality? I don't know. All I do know is, Allah, you are hidden gems concealed within a treasure chest. And every disclosure gets me closer to understanding my Everest. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. We hope you enjoyed the poetry. Thank you again to the Aga Khan Museum for giving Selene and I this opportunity to share our work with the world. Uh, I hope you all stay safe, happy, and healthy. Take care.